Thank you. Hey, right off the bat, for people who uh, who haven't met you yet and and maybe hearing you for the very first time, and it, it, I guess we don't have a, probably a lot of time for your life story, but a bit of a biography that you might be able to give them. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I'm I'm Jeremy Gilbert. I'm running for the Republican nomination for the U.S. Senate in Idaho. Um, I am new to politics, uh, but I I'm not new to service. I uh, formerly was a, an infantry officer in the U.S. Army. Uh, I ran operations for a major conservative think tank called the Heritage Foundation, uh, and I've held leadership positions in the private sector uh, at different uh, at different organizations. So I spent my life serving and elevating others, um, and that's really what I'm all about right now as I transition to a, uh, a political office uh, serving the people of Idaho. Um, quick background, I guess, is uh, besides my military service, I was born and raised in, um, in a small town in New Jersey on a family farm, uh, spent my life uh, working towards serving in the Army, and then afterwards um, continuing to accelerate in, in the private sector, um, working for a nonprofit and for, and for businesses. I came to Idaho a few years ago, and I absolutely love it here. It's the best decision I ever could have made in my life. I, I've talked to a bunch of people who have said, you know, I'm American by birth and I'm Idaho, Idaho and by choice. And I couldn't agree more. This has been the best decision of my life to move out here and to be surrounded by the wonderful people of this great state. When you referenced the Heritage Foundation, uh, we may have a mutual friend. Uh, I've, I've been acquainted for years with Rob Bluey, who of course is the uh, editor of yeah, the publication. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, Rob and his, and his wife, I've, I've worked with both of them. So great people. He's also glad that he doesn't live where he used to. He grew up in Utica, New York. So uh. <laughs> I don't know if it's much of an upgrade to the D.C. area, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, just a little larger, that's all. Hey, I, I was looking over your website uh, the last few days, and uh, it's uh, we should point out it's jeremygilbert.com, right? You've kept it fairly simple like that. Uh, it's actually jeremygilbertid.com, or you could just also search um, G- uh jgidaho.com. Either way, I'll bring you to the site. So Jeremy Gilbert ID, and that's for idaho.com. And Correct. people can look it up. And, and one of the things that caught my attention was you didn't waste any time in, uh, in, in giving a lot of space on the webpage to a number of different issues that you'd like to address. But before we get to some of those, uh, I was just actually, I had a, I had a meeting yesterday with a staffer uh, from Mr. Crapo's office at the, uh, the local office in Twin Falls. And they were seeking some feedback just on how our listenership, our, our audience base, has reacted to some recent legislation out of Washington. And I guess the point I could tell them is not well when it came to the uh, the $1.2 trillion spending bill. Uh, what was your take on that? Well, I, you know, I think first and foremost, I think a lot of people, including myself, see that piece of legislation as a, as a bait and switch. So you ever ever heard of the stereotypical used cars experience where you see a car online, you go into the shop and um, it, it's, it's what you saw, but the price isn't exactly what it is. And as you get into the finer details way, it's, it's really not what you thought it was. And the price is a lot more than you thought. That's, that's really what I, I see here is that, uh, is that we, were, we were pitched one bill, which was an infrastructure bill that was paid for. And what we got was a bill full of wasteful spending and pet projects like bike, bike trails and state roadways that aren't the responsibility of the federal government. It's not paid for. It's going to create new taxes and fees, which nobody is a fan of, or at least no conservative is, is typically a fan of that kind of stuff. And it's really going to exacerbate the inflation situation that we're seeing across the country. So, you know, I see Republicans who supported and, and created this bill as sort of the ones who were the salesmen and sold us a, a bad deal. The, uh, one of the first things you mentioned on uh, on this website is term limits. Uh, so I guess you believe that perhaps it's long time then that Mr. Crapo step aside. Yes, I, I do. So my my uh, my personal philosophy is that uh, nobody should hold a seat of power such as a, as a federal Senate seat or a um, a federal representative seat for uh, for as long as. Some people have. I mean, we have people in Washington, D.C. today who spend 24, 30, 35 years in a, or 36 years in a seat. Um, and, and what I've seen and what a lot of people have told me when I've engaged them is that the longer somebody's in a seat in Washington, D.C., the less they're connected with the people that they're supposed to be representing. I mean, and that is obvious here in the case of Mike Crapo. Mike was, you know, he, he was a very popular uh, politician back in the day. He rated really high on the Freedom Index. Um, he often did legislation that was very supportive. If you look at the performance of 
the last couple of years, that's really dipped. A lot of people say he doesn't come back to the state anymore, including his neighbors out in Idaho Falls. Um, he has consistently been introducing legislation that really can't even make it out of committee. Um, and, and if you look at last year, comparing him to other radical politicians in Washington, D.C. On, on the left who also couldn't get legislation out of committee, um, that, that, that's a telling sign because the, the Republican Party was in, was the majority last year. So you'd assume that you could introduce things that were at least popular enough amongst your party to make it out of committee, Hey, make it, maybe even make it to the floor for a vote, um, and that was not the case. So uh, the longer you're there, the more you're ingrained in the system. You're looking for ways to just put yourself back in office. You're not connected to the people you're supposed to be representing, and it shows. It shows back here at home, um, and people get frustrated with that. So. I, uh, I've, I've been a you know, political observer since probably the time I started reading newspapers on a regular basis in the third grade, which goes back 50 years. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I've noticed that a lot of times people will vent frustration with a particular person in office, and then along comes the primary or election day, and that person overwhelmingly gets sent back for another term. Uh, and I suspect a lot of that is just because of name recognition, specifically you know, you, you face some challenges there because you, you know, uh, as you point out, a relative newcomer to uh, elective politics and his name recognition is obviously off the charts in the state of Idaho. It's a process question, but how do you overcome that? So m my campaign uh, philosophy is pretty simple when it comes to this. I agree 100 percent, by the way, that name recognition has a lot to do with it. And a lot of people would like to vote for the um, the devil you know versus the devil you don't know to use something that I think my mom would have used back in the day. But um, I, the way that I'm going to combat that is to get out in the field and meet the people of Idaho. I think that um, putting that personal touch on it, something that larger campaigns maybe aren't willing to do anymore because they're so big and they feel like they can just ride on ads, commercials and, um, and name recognition. I'm going to get out and I'm, I'm going to meet with people. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that when people are able to put a face to the name and ask me questions and solicit feedback directly from me, seeing my expressions, my honest opinion on things, um, that that's going to help them see that maybe I am the better option of the two um, if I'm going to be more concerned about what they actually think and not just go to Washington, D.C. And, and advance my agenda or even just um, go along with whatever the party tells you. Because, you know, I'm, I'm a Republican, been a Republican my whole life. Um, I will tell you that I don't agree with everything that the Republican Party does. Um, I don't agree with the leadership on the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, obviously, um, and I would have voted against it. So um, I think that uh, that's the kind of thing that people in Idaho want, and if they can see that in the candidate, they'd be willing to support me. I understand 100% that I, I don't have the money and the recognition, but you know what? I would rather have a grassroots campaign of meeting Idahoans and spending minimal money and show people who I really am instead of coming in and um, having an artificially inflated campaign with outside money and tons of ad space. That's not as important to me. Well, I've got to mention, just in case anybody's just tuning in, uh, Jeremy Gilbert is joining us this morning. He's a Republican. He plans to challenge. He's filed, actually, so that plans is probably a late word, to challenge U.S. Senator Mike Crapo in next May's primary. We're at 54. It's 914 on Magic Valley this morning with Bill Colley. And you're listening to News Radio 96.1 FM and 1310 KLIX. Got to ask you this question because of recent developments. As a military veteran, uh, what we've just seen transpire in Afghanistan over the last week, uh, what's your initial response to all of that? It's it's heartbreaking. So I'll start with that. I, I've been a proponent of, of withdrawing from Afghanistan for a long time. Uh, I You know, the soldier has the most to lose in war. And being at war for this long, there's a lot of soldiers and their families that are definitely impacted by um, by this conflict. Uh, we, our mission was clear when we went to Afghanistan. It's been diluted over time. The mission when we went there was to eliminate Osama bin Laden and, their, and the al-Qaeda's ability to operate within that country freely. We ended up battling the Tal Taliban because they were giving them safe refuge. Once that threat was neutralized, um, in my opinion, we should have withdrawn. Uh, that being said, the withdrawal that we saw transpire under the current Biden administration has been abysmally a failure it, it is you couldn't have you couldn't have done this any worse if you planned it to go this badly um, and really that's not a reflection on the soldiers or even the the diplomats that are there on the ground or the civilians that are that are still now trapped behind enemy lines not being able to get to the airport what it is it's a failure on the leadership um, 
if you couldn't see this coming, then you have zero idea of what the war was actually like in Afghanistan. I could tell you back in 2011 that when we withdrew our air power, that the that the ANSF forces were going to be overwhelmed. They relied very heavily on the United States and our and our and our ability to support them. So to feed the American people a, lo- a line that uh, that the, the forces were going to last a lot longer than they should than they were going to. Uh, was just a dereliction of duty. And then to not react in a way that was appropriate as the situation developed on the ground is, is absolutely horrible. And I, I put that squarely on the Department of Defense. Um, that we've been, If you've listened to any of the press briefings that have been going on with the um, General Milley, who's the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or Secretary Austin, the, the Secretary of Defense, they're, they're essentially telling us that this is exactly how we thought it was going to go. If this is how you saw the withdrawal going, you do not deserve to be in a position in charge of the national defense of our country. It's, it's absolutely horrible. Um, and right now, you can't change, we can't change the past. What happened Saturday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you can't change that. What we can do is we can now adapt to the situation. We're still withdrawing from Afghanistan. That, sh- that, that of course, um, should be the goal, and we shouldn't go back on that. But there are American citizens that are trapped in Afghanistan right now, and we need to surge forces appropriately in order to get those American citizens out of the country. And I also agree with pulling out any Afghan, any Afghan who was supporting the American effort. And I know that might be wildly unpopular with some, some folks, especially in Idaho. But to be honest, um, if you've never served there and worked alongside of a translator who put themselves and their family's life on the line to help Americans and save Americans like I've seen, um, that I don't think that you should, have a com- you should have a say in that conversation because um, you, have, you have no idea what sacrifices that they've given up for our country. So uh, we need to search appropriately. We need to show the United States is not afraid of the Taliban. Uh, and 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 give safe passage to all American citizens and our allies um, who need to flee the country. Um, after that, you know, it, it, it's 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 up to the Afghan people. They have an opportunity now. We've seen uprisings happening across the country. We've seen um, the murmurs of a of a rebellion established or getting established in Afghanistan. And I applaud that effort. The Taliban. It, it's an absolutely horrible organization that has done ridiculously horrible things in the past. And I really hope that the Afghan people have the heart to stand up for themselves and say, I will not live under tyranny um, for the rest of our existence. Got to get to a break in just about a minute. Can you recap a little bit about the website as well and how people might be able to make a contribution Absolutely. if they'd be interested? Absolutely, yeah. The, our website is uh, jeremygilbertid.com, but you can find us by just searching jgidaho.com. Um, and it's full of a lot of information. It has a, a little bit about the campaign and myself and why I've decided to run. If you're curious, you can engage us and ask questions or volunteer um, there's two different donation platforms that you can get on and give. We would love to see uh, anybody who has the ability to give and wants to support our campaign to do so. The only way we survive is off the generosity of our donors. And I personally guarantee you that if you uh, if you engage our website about volunteering or you have a question, we're going to get back to you because we are a grassroots campaign and we really want to engage with the voters of Idaho. Oh, we'll get, to, we'll get to some questions in just a couple of minutes. We've got to get to a break, though. First, we've got more coming up with Jeremy Gilbert. He is a candidate for United States Senate. He's a Republican, and he will be challenging Mike Crapo, the incumbent, in a primary in May of 2022. We're at 51, on our way today, perhaps into the mid-70s. And then, finally, a warm-up starts again this weekend and moves through next week. But it won't be quite as hot as it was throughout much of the summer. 20 minutes after 9 o'clock. Bill Colley on Magic Valley this morning on News Radio 961 FM, 1310 KLIX, and com. U.S. Senator and incumbent Mike Crapo in a primary next May, uh, in May of 2022. Bill Colley with you as well. It's 923. We're at 53 on uh, News Radio 961 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. A couple of questions that have come in uh, for the candidate and Jeremy, there's a fellow by the name of Eli uh, who's curious to know. He said that big money, of course, is corrupting people in politics. How do you, if you get in, how do you avoid, you know, the same temptations that everyone else has faced? Uh, great question, Eli. I, um, so one of the one of the big things that we just talked about was term limits, which I am absolutely a huge fan of. Um, I, I am not just a... Um, a proponent of term limits being forced on other people, but I also agree of those being put on myself. So the first thing that I want to say is that I'm going to self-impose a two-term limit on myself if I am fortunate enough to um, to be elected as the, the senator for Idaho. Um, so that, that's one step that I'm going to take. I think that big money definitely affects you when you're trying to run over and over and over. Campaigns 
um, sadly take a take a lot of money to 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 to, to do um, you know between ad space and events and swag. Um, so to, that's that's one step. I think that understanding that I'm not in this for the long haul makes it less appealing to throw big money at me um, and uh, and try to get me to be you know essentially their their person on Capitol Hill versus being the the supporter of um, the supporter of the people of Idaho. Um, also, the, my motivations for running are not to be in the limelight. I think I talk about this on my website, um, and I'll continue to tell people this, that I, I never thought that I would be running for politics. I, I've always been more comfortable behind the scenes. I like to help people um, who, are, who are pushing towards um, bettering the country. I've, I've never wanted to do this before. What's motivated me to do this is listening to the frustrations of people in Idaho and, and especially around the fact that they feel like nobody will ever challenge the incumbents because if those if somebody inside the political establishment of Idaho challenges an incumbent, they lose their opportunity to be their replacement when they decide to retire or, or resign or, or what have you. So um, that's my goal is not to, to be the representative of any sort of big industry. Instead, it's about the individual Idahoans and being their voice on Capitol Hill. So um, while people can feel free to donate small donations to me, I'm not seeking any large donations from companies um, or from individuals to, to be their mouthpiece on Capitol Hill. So really, you have, you, have my, you have my word, which, you know, in, in politics seems like it doesn't mean very much anymore. Uh, but luckily, I'm not a politician, so my, my word still means something to me. Got another message uh, from a writer in Twin Falls who said he's emailed you and he said, uh, he said, Lord and willing, he's going to meet with you next Saturday. He said he's been great to communicate with and very prompt in answering questions. And then he says, this guy needs more airtime. So there you go. There's a <laughs> bit of a ringing endorsement. I have a caller. There we go. I have a caller looking to join us too as well. And we're at 927. Uh, caller, we'll give you a couple of minutes to get your question out, and then we may have to get back to it after the break. But go ahead. Well, I've been calling Mr. Crapo for years, and whenever I see him face-to-face, I ask him why he never speaks up. He never really supported Donald Trump. The people of Idaho love Donald Trump. Donald Trump has a list of accomplishments that are massive, and we all know it worked. For four years or three and a half years, the price of gas never went over $2 a gallon. We had stability in the Middle East. We had confidence in our elected, well, at least to him. And, and Crapo would just, they just, him and Rich just never say anything. I confront them face to face, ask them why I never hear them speaking up or, or talking against China. There's so much. And, and see, they know they're going to get reelected. They know it. So we need to get rid of them. I would run against them too, but I couldn't win. I hope the hell you do. I'll hang up. I want to thank him for the call. Jeremy, we've got about a minute, uh, a minute and a half to go before the break. Uh, your response? Yeah, sure. I think uh, so. A, a lot of career politicians we saw in Washington D.C. did not support Trump, um, and mostly because I think that you know in the long game they thought it might be political suicide to support somebody who was who was very radical personally. Um, what I'll tell you is that uh, the I know a lot of people worked on the Trump administration uh, personally, coming from Heritage or or from other organizations that I I worked around, and they were phenomenal people. And you know, no matter what you say about Donald Trump, and um, you know whether you didn't like his tweeting or whatever it is. You know that they, they made promises to the American people and they kept them. So uh, the caller I didn't catch his name was absolutely 100 percent right that um, that they were doing the things that they told us that they were going to do and and to not support the administration in their efforts to uh, further conservative values is is was a dereliction for sure. So I'm not a huge fan of um, a, of of elevating any one person because we are we are definitely a country that's not based on that. We don't have a king or uh, or a monarch of any kind. So. Uh, I, what I'll say is that I, I supported the actions that the Donald Trump administration did. They did some great work, um, and I would love to see more of that go to Washington, D.C. More on the way with Jeremy Gilbert in just a short while. We're coming up on 930. It's 53. Bill Colley with you, too, on Magic Valley this morning on News Radio 96.1 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Jeremy is a candidate for U.S. Senate, a Republican. He'll be challenging Mike Crapo, the incumbent, in a primary next May uh, in the year 20. 20- Jeremy Gilbert joining us this morning. He's here until 10 a.m. On Magic Valley this morning, it's 55. We're at 9.33. Bill Colley with you, too, on News Radio 96 1 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Jeremy is a Republican, and he's going to be challenging Mike Crapo in a U.S. Senate primary next year here in Idaho. 
Jeremy, I got an interesting question that came in from a friend, and uh, I bring this up only because uh, a couple of weeks back uh, there was a lot of noise about uh, about Ed Humphreys and things that Ed did when he was 20 years old, and I know some of the talk show hosts in the state have been somewhat pointed with him about that. I I wasn't because when I was 20, I did a lot of boneheaded things myself, and it's I probably didn't become a mature adult until I was 50, for crying out loud. But um, the the writer says he's just concerned. He said, you know, he said he likes what you're saying, but do you have any skeletons in the closet that could come out and uh, harm you pre-primary? There he is. Sorry about that. Did you hear the question? Jeremy, you with us? I'm with you, yep. Did All right, the question was, uh, someone is asking me, they say they like what you're saying. But do you have any skeletons in the closet that could come forth? In other words, they'll be doing some deep dives on you in the other campaign. Sure. Uh, oh yeah. Um, well, I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a normal person. I guess you can you can these days I think in politics that you can you can find uh, literally anything and make it seem like the biggest issue uh, in the world. I mean, I was uh, I was a I was a very uh, normal army officer when I was stationed in Europe, which means that you know every once in a while you you go out and have some, have some good fun. And I, I think that some people could probably use that as a, as an opportunity to pick on me, but you know, I've, I've tried to live my life true to my core values, um, which is, you know, the, it, which, which is the way I was raised. So, um, at, at the end of the day, no, there's no skeletons in my closet that, uh, that, that come to life that I'd be embarrassed about. So, you know, uh, you know, and of course, I made the comment. You know, when Ed Humphreys was on the air a couple of weeks ago, he's been taking some grief because, you know, people say he did certain things when he was twenty years old, and I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't hammer him on those questions because I was not always the smartest kid at twenty. Uh, you know, it took me a long time to wise up, and he turned his life around. And you know, people are different people in different stages of sure. their lives, and I just think sometimes in politics we get very unforgiving. Uh, things oh, yeah. come up, and and you know, there's a if somebody, I, Mitt Romney, and I'm not promoting Mitt in any way, but when Mitt Romney was running for president, the Washington Post said in a story that when Mitt was 15, he may have been a bully to another kid in class. Now, Mitt was 64 at the time. Come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I'll, I'll use, I a prime example of that is, you know, when I was when I was 22 years old, um, I was leading 45 soldiers in Afghanistan um, in charge of a, a, a patch of area that was humongous. I was, I was 22. So put my, put me into context with what you would typically think a 21 or 22 year old um, person would be. And I was in charge of a battle space. And I mean, you know, if I was looking from the outside, I'd be like, man, he might've been a little mean or, you know, he was a little aggressive, but you know, it was, it was the, the, the nature of the beast of, of my job. And um, I would never say that ever that I'm ashamed of that. Um, but the circumstances of people's lives are different at different stages. Um, and if you truly do something that's wrong and, I think I think you know America is definitely the place, and this is off off topic. So I, I apologize, but America is the place of second chances, and there's tons of people out there who do things throughout their life that are, you know, maybe not the best. And I think that when people do that and they um, they they make amends, they 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 pay their debt, that they should be accepted back into into society. So I see attacks all across the political world where people pick on things like, "Oh, you were a bully when you were a kid," or "Oh, you you drank underage," or whatever it is. And I'm like, you know that. I get it. We, we all we all make mistakes. To tell you the truth, anybody right now in Washington D.C. that tells you that they're a perfect angel, they are lying to your face. I, I've been around these people um, that you know nobody's perfect. There's not a single one of us in this country that can say I lived a perfect life and never made mistakes. And we should stop approaching politicians just that way, just like we don't with anybody else in our society. That's just my little plug. Got about a minute and a half before the break. Maybe we can start with this and then pick up on it after the break too, as well. Energy independence. Um, we've yeah. we've lost that in the last oh seven months or eight months now with the new president. Uh, what do you propose? So I uh, first off, I think that the the idea of, of shutting down the Keystone Pipeline was just uh, it, idiotic. Like I, I don't know where where the great idea of that came from, um, but you know, there's been a lot of these these ideas coming out of the administration. So that's absolutely horrible. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to see that that decision reversed. You know. The, the idea that Congress doesn't have the power to do it, that's untrue. Um, they just don't have the will right now. And when we're looking at our, we're looking at the last, we'll just go all the last 24 months and how prices of just regular gas at the pump has just gone up. And especially after January, this is totally due to decisions that are being made in Washington, D.C. that are more, 
and I hate to use the word because it, it, it's silly, but the, it's, it's more about being woke than it is about being smart and caring about the American people. So I think we can start there is that when, when the Republicans take the majority back in the House and Senate in 2022 is that we should move on things like that to set ourselves up for long term um, in energy independence in, in the oil world. Um, I, I also am a huge proponent of nuclear power. I think that, uh, you know, that the idea that um, nuclear power doesn't have a place in our future is is, is wrong. I mean, it's, the, it's the, the energy source that powers our nation's aircraft carriers. There's there's uh, plants all over the country that help power cities and all over the world. Um, and I think that we should really take a hard look at using those more um, to power our key infrastructure. We've got more coming up with Jeremy Gilbert. Again, he's a Republican. He's running for U.S. Senate. He'll challenge Mike Crapo in a primary next May. We're at 940. It is 56. Bill Colley telling you that coming up in a couple of minutes, Cal Thomas and his uh, his morning commentary. And you're listening to News Radio 961 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Jeremy Gilbert joining us this morning. And as I've been mentioning uh, this hour of the program, he's a Republican. He's running for U.S. Senate. He'll be challenging the incumbent, Mike Crapo, in a primary next year. Uh, that'll be in May of 2022. So we're those months, by the way, will just come flying by. I think we're all quite well aware of that. Bill Colley with you too on News Radio 96 1 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. We're at 55, it's 946. So we've got a few more minutes left with the candidate. Uh, very touching story in his background. Uh, Jeremy was uh, born to a woman who could have chosen to have him aborted. Uh, instead, though, she gave him up for adoption, and he was raised by his adoptive family. And if you want to know where he stands on uh, on, a, on a child's right to life, that may explain it. But, Jeremy, I'll let you pick it up from there, and maybe you can give folks a little bit more detail and background on where you stand on the issue. Uh, yeah, so uh, 100% correct. Uh, I think that uh, I I formulated my stance, well, my, my stance on, a, on, on child's rights uh, on— the right to life based off of my, my story, my personal story where I could have been aborted and wasn't and instead was able to have a wonderful life and also my religious background. So uh, those, those two things kind of intertwine to, to wanting to protect the, our most vulnerable population, which is um, children who can't defend themselves, unborn children. Um, I, uh, I was born, I was raised in a very, uh, very religious household, um, my family was engaged in our church and, you know, I've never, I was, it was always brought to being that the only choice is to protect innocent life. And that obviously um, extends to, to the womb. Um, I, I've gotten really passionate about this over the past couple of years, um, really as the, the rhetoric has stepped up about how unborn babies aren't actual humans. Instead, they're, they're just, I think the best term that it, that is often thrown at me is a cluster of cells, which infuriates me because, um, you know, if, if you look at a, a baby in the womb after only a couple of weeks, you'll see that it's not a cluster of cells. It's, it's, a, it's a miniature human being, um, you know, the heartbeat at six weeks and um, fully formed and ready to be born, um, you know, could be, I just, a month before, I, I actually just had a, a colleague of mine um, who had a baby that came um, 14 weeks premature. And the baby is living just fine right now, just went home from the hospital and is going to have a wonderful life. And there's some in the, in the country um, and in the world right now that would say 14 weeks before um, before being born, like, yeah, you can go ahead and abort that. Like, it's not a real it's not a real human yet. And that's 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 utterly utterly it just it hurts my heart more than anything else to think about how many babies never get the opportunity to have a right to live. Uh, and, you know, there's a there's a there's a mindset out there that uh, if you have an abortion, that it's actually just resetting the pregnancy. Okay, like that that individual human being that's inside inside their inside your body, um, it just it just it, go, it just goes away. And then when you decide to have a baby later on in the future, that same being comes in. But really, that's Jeremy Gilbert that's aborted and will never have an opportunity to, to come into this world. And that's 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 so sad. And you know, this is in no way to to shame people and to to you know saying like if you had an abortion you're a horrible person that's not the case it's, it's, this is about education it's like you've been fed something that is utterly false and that to say that you can control when a human being um, comes into the world and really you can if you have an abortion you're choosing to end that person that baby's life but they'll never have an opportunity to come back it's not a reset um, it, it is just it, it's just a death and that's absolutely sad 
I have a note from uh, Marie in Coeur d'Alene, and she's obviously listening online or on the app, but uh, she said, because you referenced religious beliefs or religious faith, uh, she said, I'm curious about Jeremy's religious beliefs. Uh, so I'm, I'm a Catholic, so uh, I was, I was, uh, my wife and I are both practicing Catholics. We, we go to a church here in, um, in Boise, Idaho. Uh, absolutely love our community. We try to stay as engaged as possible um, with both our, our church and then other members of the, of the religious community outside of our church that um, have some of the values to us. So um, it's always been a, part, a big part of our life. We actually, my wife and I, um, we're, we actually got married at the chapel at her college, which is Xavier University in Ohio, um, because she felt so connected to that building and the people that were, um, that were holding the services there that we, even though we didn't live in Ohio, she hadn't lived in Ohio for years, we went back to Ohio and made all of our friends and family fly there um, so that that could be a part of our, the beginning of our, of our marriage, which well, I think will tell you a little bit how, how connected we are to our church. If you ever want to you know, travel out to Caldwell, uh, I know the pastor at the Roman Catholic Church there very, very well, and a uh, very good conservative individual himself. Uh, but you would really get a—you'd enjoy meeting him. His name is uh, Father Mike St. Marie, and of course he was our pastor here in Twin Falls for several years. And uh, he got in trouble, I think, at the 2014 GOP convention because he prayed uh, for people to find work, uh, except for Barack Obama. I think it was 2012 convention, uh, to, who might lose his job. Uh, oh. And mainstream media didn't like that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can't have an opinion if you're, you know, if you're apparently a religious person, you're supposed to keep your opinions to yourself. Sure. <laughs> Here's another yeah. question from a Bob and Filer. Actually, he's got two. Uh, and he wants to know your feelings about the Second Amendment and big tech censorship. Ooh, Second Amendment. I know this has actually come up quite a bit because I, I chose not to put it on the website because in, in my mind it's a given. You know, I've been around guns my entire adult life. I won't say as a child because my mom was not necessarily a big hunter and she uh, was more so on the in the idea that um, that people were generally good so she didn't need to protect her house. You know, she's learned now. She's, I bought my mom a shotgun and she absolutely loves it. Um, hasn't had to use it yet except for shooting cans and stuff, but she's, she's <laughs> almost 80 years old and out there shooting the, shooting the thought off. So I absolutely love it. But yeah, I've been around uh, firearms my entire adult life. Um, it, it is a part of me. And I, you know, I, I'm in a, a unique category as are millions of other Americans where I've, I've actually used a firearm to, you know, d- defend the nation, which ultimately was why the second amendment was established, right? To, well, maybe to, to make sure that our government did overstep its bounds, but also to, you know, to use it to defend our, our, our interests. Um, so it's, it's like, it's like a, it's like my arm at, at most of my life. It's been attached to the side of my body. I'm very comfortable with it. Um, and then on the, on the personal side, I've owned firearms my entire life. I think 18, when I could buy one, I bought my first AR. Um, I am very disciplined at ensuring that I maintain my proficiency at it because while I, I, think anybody who is legally allowed to own a firearm should, they should also be safe about it. I mean, a firearm is no joke. I've, I've seen career army uh, infantry soldiers shoot themselves in the foot. Um, it, so it, it, while that, while it's something that we're guaranteed through the Constitution, and, and I agree that everyone who wants to should exercise that right, um, you need to be safe about it. You need to be educated. Just because you buy a gun, you're, you are not a proficient uh, owner or, or user of a, of a firearm. So that'll be my plug for uh, make sure that you're safe with those because, you know, there's a lot of gun deaths in America that could be preventable if, if people just got a little bit of education. And that's common sense. Um, and then I, I do agree really that anybody who shouldn't own a firearm should, shouldn't have one. So if, you're, if you are excluded from having one because um, you are a felon and, and that's the law, then I, I don't agree that you should have a firearm. Um, so they're, they're, I, um, I, am, I am definitely for the idea of making sure that legal citizens have, and are, have firearms and are able to exercise their constitutional rights. And that if you aren't allowed to have one, like a, a non-citizen or somebody who's a felon, then I don't believe that you should have one. Uh, and then on to, well, I, I, I'm sorry, I missed, I actually, uh, I forgot the second question. Yeah, big, big tech censorship. I just big read tech. this morning where Twitter will not suspend uh, the Taliban's Twitter feed, but uh, big tech yeah. censorship of, of impacts a lot of Americans. Sure, yeah, I think I think uh, social media platforms are, especially right now, are dancing on the fine line of whether or not they are a platform for for speech or if they are a publisher. And I know this conversation has been, um, been going back and forth for a long time. Um, and the, the idea that you can censor some things that you don't like and promote, not even just allow, but promote other speech that you do like, um, is absolutely horrible. Uh, you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of, of thought around the idea of, of removing protections around big tech 
uh, well, social media platforms specifically, um, who are, are essentially putting their thumbs on the scale of the First Amendment. Um, I, I, I'd be open for those conversations right about now to saying, like, I'm not going to, you know, we're not going to uh, come and force things down upon you like I think a lot of the Democrats are threatening to do, uh, where they say, if you don't publish the way I want you to, then we're going to instill these, in, we're going to take away your, your, your permissions. But on the flip side of that, I think if you continue to operate in a, in a biased manner, that you should not be protected by the federal government from lawsuits, for example, if you encourage slander or um, if you uh, if you are essentially giving in-kind donations to political candidates by silencing their opponents. Um, I think that, that you should not have the benefits um, if you're not going to be willing to play by the rules. Yeah, just under two minutes. Uh, speaking of, uh, you know, in-kind donations or other issues, uh, a writer quickly, he wants to know uh, how much money you think it will take to defeat Mr. Crapo. Oh, man. Uh, my the, the, my heart, or what I want to tell you is, it's going to take a hundred thousand dollars because I'm like that's too, that sounds like too much money in a political campaign. Um, I think that it's going to take way more than that. I mean, I think uh, I think Mr. Crapo has got about four million in the bank. If I do, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm sure he's going to use as much as he needs to to hold on to that office because that's what incumbents do. And then he's going to receive donations from uh, from other organizations and PACs to keep him in power because there's a lot of people in Washington D.C. I'm sure that would be very upset to lose somebody who they've pretty much had in their corner for um, for over two decades um, and then have to take a chance on somebody like me who already says I'm not going to play by their uh, but with their game so uh, I, I don't know to be honest I, I, I'm I am I'm going to uh, do my best to raise and spend the donations that I get wisely and I want to put all that money if I can back into Idaho the money that we've already spent um, we put into Idaho small businesses so for the swag that we've done the website build everything that we've done so far we're putting it right back into the economy so um, that, that if, if I can do that for my campaign, I really don't care. And this, this, I don't know if this is campaign suicide. I'm sure that my staff is going to yell at me for a second here, but I don't really care how much I, I bring in as long as the message is getting out to the people. Um, and that the donations that I'm receiving are the small donations, um, from people who are really care about the future of not just Idaho, but the, the country as a whole. Quickly, uh, your website again. Yeah. Best way to get us is, uh, jgidaho.com got everything you need on there from uh, about me to uh, the issues I stand on, how to contact us and volunteer, and, and what we just talked about, um, donations. Jeremy, we'll talk again. Awesome. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Yeah, you as well. Bye-bye now. Jeremy Gilbert joining us this morning on Magic Valley this morning on News Radio 96.1 FM, 1310 KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Bill Colley saying, God willing, in the creek don't rise, I'll be back in this seat. On Monday morning between 6 and 10 a.m., Dan Bongino on the way.